It is May the 18th, 2023, and you are listening to a very special episode of Curiously Polar, the podcast about all things very north and very south. Welcome to Curiously Polar, I'm Chris, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Henry Hi. and Mario. Hi. If you're watching this on video, you can also see that there's more than just the three of us. We're excited to bring you a very special episode, a collaboration with the Polar Geopolitics Podcast. Uh, joining us are two voices in the study of polar geopolitics and environmental governance. First, we have Professor Klaus Dodds, the Executive Dean of the School of Life Sciences and Environment at uh, Royal Holloway, University of London, and also Eric Paglia, a postdoc fellow in the Sphere Project investi investigating the evolution of global environmental governance and he is also the host of the Polar Geopolitics podcast. Welcome everyone. Uh, let's get right into it. Let me, let me hand this over to Henry. Henry, <laughs> take, take it away from here. Thanks, Chris. And hi, and welcome everyone uh, as well from my side. Uh, it's really nice to have you on the podcast. I'm a big, big fan of ge um, polar geopolitics. And I'm, I'm so, so happy that we finally managed to have a, a joined episode here. Um, Professor Dots, welcome on the show. And I would love you to uh, introduce you a little bit more in detail. Hands over to you. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, really, really great to, to be with you. And um, my name is Klaus Dodds, and I, I work in the field of polar geopolitics. And for the last 30 years, I've been going up north and up down south and really had the pleasure and privilege of working with uh, lots of interested stakeholders who care very deeply about the current and future state of the polar regions. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Professor Dutt. Um, Eric, also welcome to you. Uh, welcome to our show. Um, you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, well, I think Chris uh, did a good job of just basically saying I'm, uh, I'm a researcher at uh, the Division of History of Science, Technology and Environment at uh, KTH in Stockholm, KTH World Institute of Technology. I've um, been hosting the Polar Geopolitics podcast since 2018. I think it's just a fabulous idea that uh, you came up with here, Henry, to... Uh, Join forces here for this episode and speak to, to Klaus, who's a um, uh, recurring uh, guest on uh, polar geopolitics. And also, I got to say that for this particular topic, I think I was first introduced to the, this, the these issues surrounding the uh, extended continental shelf by um, by Klaus, a lecture that you gave at uh, KTH when I was a PhD student, probably ten years ago, maybe maybe even further back, maybe twelve years ago, and. Um, it was a real eye-opening presentation, and uh, it's fantastic that we can uh, talk about this particular subject uh, on this episode here. Absolutely, and for me, it's really uh, interesting. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of um, geopolitics, just uh, following it around. And as our podcast is not really that kind of a niche podcast as uh, polar geopolitics, it's really difficult to, to have that expertise on the show um, very, on, a, on a regular basis. We, we try to tackle it every now and then. So let's start and talk a little bit about um, the North Pole or the scramble for the pole. And when we want to talk, uh, talk about the scramble of the pole, we have to talk a little bit about the setting as well or just give a little glint, uh, a glimpse to it. And when we see the Central Arctic Ocean with an area of roughly 3.3 3 million um, square kilometers, um, that includes the North Pole, which is technically 4,261 meters below the surface. It's on the uh, bottom of the uh, of the basin over there. So that's a very um, inaccessible spot, if you like, unlike the South Pole. So there's a major difference there. And when we talk about the scramble of the pole, the territorial claims of the North Pole, that makes things really difficult if it's not a landmass you actually can access on an easy base. Um, Professor Dots, um, can you, would you say that the 2007 Russian expedition um, to the North Pole, where the submarine actually planted that flag at the bottom of the ocean, um, has put the North Pole on the general map of the general audience. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's no there's no question that when when that image was released um, to the world's media, that it then ushered in. A, a very different kind of conversation about the sort of North Pole, Central Arctic Ocean. And that's where, for example, leading media organizations like BBC News framed this uh, apparent event uh, as a new scramble for the Poles. And I think I would, I would just say two things right at the start. 
first of all, it's not the first time we've had so-called scrambles for the poles. So whether we're looking north or looking south, depending on our starting point, we've had previous scrambles. And obviously there'll be lots of people listening to this show who will be familiar with other kinds of scrambles as well uh, that go beyond the polar regions. But I think it was really striking that that framing was alighted upon initially to make sense of it. But then when you dig into the details, it's a complicated story. It's the, the, the submersibles that descend gently to the bottom of the Central Arctic Ocean a part of an oceanographic expedition, and we'll get on to why they were there, I'm sure, later on. But it was also partially funded by a Swedish billionaire who was also very, very passionate about the polar regions. So it has this curious public-private mix to it. It's not an exclusively Russian show, but nonetheless, what audiences see is a Russian flag, uh, or titanium Russian flagpole, planted at the bottom of the Central Arctic Ocean. The second thing to just to bear in mind is that the image itself also makes a difference in, in the sense of what is depicted. Imagine just for a minute as a thought experiment that image of a Russian flag was replaced by a flag of the United Nations or perhaps a flag of a smaller Arctic state um, such as uh, Iceland, for example then that might be a very different matter. We might think, well, that's a source of amusement. Or we might say, well, that's interesting. I never knew the Central Arctic Ocean might be international waters. But why did it matter? And this, this is the bit I'll, I'll sort of conclude in terms of my opening remarks. It mattered partly because of timing. In 2007, the rhetoric coming from President Putin in particular was decidedly chillier, if you excuse the pun, we had a real sense that that relationship with Russia was changing. And I think, speaking now in 2023, given everything we know, there was probably something here that would give us pause for thought about whether we were witnessing the start of a more expansionist Russian Federation. But it was not only that the, the climate was chilling down between Russia and the West. The timing was also in regards to the claim itself, because Russia joined the um, convention on the, uh, on the, on the seas um, in 1997. And as far as I understood, the claim can only be done within 10 years of um, ratifying the convention. Is, is that right? Yes. So, so it's worth saying that actually the first Russian submission, technical submission, regarding what uh, outer continental shelf claims was actually made in 2001. So what you witnessed in 2007 was Russia seeking to expand upon and improve upon a submission that it made uh, some, some six odd years earlier. And it's important to give again, sort of the audience context here. What Russia was engaged in in 2007 was an entirely legal process. So the Law of the Sea Convention, which is effectively the blueprint for how we govern and manage the world's oceans and seas, provides certain opportunities for coastal states. And Russia is, of course, an enormous coastal state, as is Canada, the United States, and others. But it provides them with an opportunity to extend their sovereign rights over the seabed. And it is a complex technical legal set of operations. But what Russia was engaged in was, in essence, an information gathering exercise designed to improve a potential submission that could lead to an extension of its sovereign rights over the Arctic seabed. The image that um, people will be familiar with of that Russian flagpole was highly symbolic and utterly legally and technically irrelevant to the real work the Russian Federation has engaged in. So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of oddness about 2007. On the one hand, it's a kind of show and tell. Aren't we amazing that we can 
descend to the bottom of this ocean and gently deposit a flagpole, but it shouldn't confuse anybody from the serious business in hand, which was trying to extend Russia's domain over a vast area of the Arctic Ocean seabed. Absolutely, and it created a huge media outcry back in the days, I remember that. Um, nonetheless, it was not the first time that a submersible actually went down uh, to the North Pole. Actually, um, the US Americans went down in 1958, if I remember correctly, and they measured slightly deeper depth for the North, uh, for the North Pole. And um, when we take it from, from here and just think about the, the claim or the, the outcry the Russian... Um, actions actually created. It's not the only claim we actually have in the Arctic Ocean, including the North Pole. There are literally three more countries uh, of the seven, um, of the eight uh, Arctic um, coastal countries that actually have a claim extending to the North Pole. Is that right? So let me let me just offer you a, a sort of caveat to that. So just so we're, we're really clear on what we're talking about. So there are eight self-appointed, I would say this as a, as a British academic, let me repeat myself, self-appointed Arctic states. And those Arctic states are key members of what we might come on to consider the Arctic Council, an essential intergovernmental forum, which has its own history and, and politics. Out of the eight there are a series of Arctic Ocean coastal states. And um, some of them, of course, will feature notably uh, in our conversation today. And they are Canada, Denmark, Greenland, and the Russian Federation. Um, so those are, the, those are the ones really to keep the focus on, because those are the key countries when it comes really to the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, if you're wondering who the other two are, then let's also deal with that. The other two are, in essence, the United States through Alaska, and then Norway, not least because of the Svalbard archipelago, but because of the geography of the Arctic Ocean, we're really only talking about three countries, Denmark, Canada, Russian Federation, that are, if you will, really, really focused in on the Central Arctic Ocean North Pole. And why is the claim of Canada, let's say, um, nowhere near as covered as the Russian claim? So the, the reason is really quite straightforward. Russia started earliest. So that's the other thing just to bear in mind with all of this, is that Russia hit hit the ground running in 2001 and Russia has been prepared to spend considerable sums of money and make considerable effort uh, to not only submit early on and then to resubmit after it received uh, so-called recommendations from the technical body that is responsible for making sense of those submissions. So if you want me to explain further, then what I would say to you is this, is that countries spend an awful lot of time and effort creating a technical submission that responds to the challenge of proving that their sovereign rights to a seabed can extend in the way that they wish. And I wouldn't wish anybody to have to read Article 76 of the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention unless they're sitting in a comfortable seat. <laughs> it, is, it is quite a daunting process to make sense of it all. And I speak to you, incidentally, as a non-international lawyer, but these, this is a highly technical scientific process. That commission, the Commission on the Law of the Continental Shelf, has the tough task of making sense of that Article 76, and that commission is composed of around 15, 16 technical experts, and then they try to evaluate, if you will, the quality of that submission, and they issue what are called recommendations. And recommendations, to make matters even more confusing, are not legally binding. 
They are recommendations. They are, they are kind of summary judgments, which then coastal states who receive them can then put to use. And if they're lucky, if they don't face potential competition, they can then start to say, we have extended our sovereign rights. Now, where this becomes complicated, yet again, is when you have areas of the world's oceans and seas where more than one party thinks they enjoy similar rights to that same seabed. And that's what makes it tricky. Russian Federation, Denmark, Greenland, Canada, they all think their rights extend to the North Pole Central Arctic Ocean. And that's the conundrum we've got to try and resolve. Which is interesting because those claims, they are scientifically underlying. So there is a lot of science going on um, since the first claim in 2001 to prove actually that the bedrock at the North Pole is part of the continental shelf of either Russia or Canada or Greenland. And when you look at the the history of the uh, of the area, you can see that all of that w where one was once merged together as one piece, and it just opened in um, geological times. So I would be not surprised if Canada and and uh, Greenland would come up at a point with a proof that the bedrock also is an extension of their shelf from a geological perspective. So the conundrum even gets more complicated. And now we jump forward to earlier this year when the, com uh, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf actually confirmed the largest portion of the scientific data underlining Russia's claim, creating a media bus saying that the UN actually um, confirmed Russia's claim, which is technically not true. Why is that? Well, um, we can, of course, speculate uh, for an awful long time about media framing and how matters that are technical, scientific, and generally speaking, complex, get sensationalized and framed in the way that they do. But look, the long and short of it is this. Russia scored something of a, a diplomatic victory earlier this year when the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, as I mentioned earlier, effectively said that there is, there is much of merit of the latest Russian submission. Um, what they said was, was that around 1.7 million square kilometers of the Russian submission, they, they are very sympathetic to, their recommendation would endorse. And if memory serves, they said something around 300,000 square kilometers, they were not persuaded by. But overall, Russia got a very good recommendation, if I can put it like that. Now, we then have to remind ourselves that Canada and Denmark have formally submitted their own technical submission to the Commission. But the Commission has such a backlog of work that it might not be to around 15 or 20 years until they actually give it the due care and consideration that it undoubtedly deserves. In the meantime, and here's the health warning, in case you're thinking that this is just a story about technical, scientific, and legal discussion and careful consideration, there's a warning. The warning comes recently from Pakistan that has started to express formal disquiet about how the rival submission of India is being treated in another part of the world. So, one of the things that Denmark and Greenland will be asking themselves in their respective foreign ministries is in the light of everything we know about the Russian Federation, are we absolutely convinced the Russian Federation remains committed to the international legal process and structures that shape all of this business? Or might it not be very tempting for a Russian Federation that appears to be fairly attracted to the idea of expansionism, to simply ignore the decade and a half long wait for potential final diplomatic adjudication and go, that's it. We, we now have more than 50% of the Arctic Ocean seabed. It's part of the Russian Federation. We extend all the way to the North Pole and beyond. 
And we're not very interested in negotiating with Canada or Denmark. Absolutely. Um, Eric, why do countries actually want to claim an area that is so difficult to access as the North Pole? Well, I would say it's it's more symbolic. I think when we often talk about the North Pole, maybe it's for symbolic reasons. I don't think there's any proven reserves at the North Pole at this point. I think it, it is mostly symbolic. And um, certainly technology is, I mean, Klaus is talking about 10 or 15 years just for adjudication of these of these um, these claims. But the technology could, could well be much longer in the future than that. So I think that the focus of the North Pole is um, maybe, yeah, a media framing issue. I mean, it's like the scramble for the Arctic uh, narrative, which emerged around the time of Russia's flag planting. Very, very interesting time, you know, following the uh, the Arctic climate uh, impact assessment in 2004, 2005, and there was the Arctic sea ice minimum. So these media narratives, they, um, yeah, they, they, they kind of gel at certain times and then they, they kind of live on, even though many experts are very, very much... Uh, critical of, of the way the media and, and sort of general narratives uh, take shape. But Klaus, what, what do you think? I mean, in terms of this, these, these claims, I mean, you say Russia could just proceed, whatever that could be, and, and maybe starting to, to build some sort of uh, exploration uh, initiatives and things like that. But are these mutual exclusive? I mean, now that they've, the, the, the CLCS is recommended that they, they they look favorably upon Russia's claim. Does that mean that they, I mean, they haven't looked at the the Danish and the, the Canadian claims yet. So could those also have merit as well? Yeah, and I'm quite certain they will have merit because in both, in both cases, um, those countries have highly professional, skilled geological surveying, um, you know, organizations that will be more than up to the task of preparing a highly competent submission. So what we're going to find is this, is we're going to find the three submissions in due course are formally um, declared to overlap with one another. We might have a few areas where the overlap is, is non-existent or minimal, but it's going to be the case almost certainly that all three countries will be able to say in practice that they have potentially sovereign rights that extend all the way to the North Pole. The key thing to bear in mind is, and what we should never lose sight of, is we're talking about seabed. But the waters in the Central Arctic Ocean are international waters. So another factor, just to sort of bear in mind, is that as the Arctic Ocean potentially opens up further, in the sense that we don't have that kind of prevailing pack ice that used to be only accessible to nuclear-powered submarines traveling underneath or nuclear-powered icebreakers traveling across the surface, we could have another situation where other countries, such as China, begin to make themselves more and more felt for whatever reason. It might be at some point, commercial fishing. It might be because there are transpolar shipping routes. It might be because there is a perception there's a military advantage to be struck. Operating, if you like, at the surface and above, whilst Russia, Denmark, Canada continue to argue, if you like, with one another about what happens below. Mm -hmm. So it's really important when we think about this issue and its geopolitics, we don't just, it, in a sense focus on the seabed in isolation. We need to take a, what I would call a volumetric approach. So we need to think about seabed, water, ice, airspace, because all of this is caught up with one another when we think about the changing Arctic geopolitics. And that's a fantastic segue, uh, Mario. When we uh, see the changing Arctic and the accessibility, we see we have almost on a yearly base uh, record lows on Arctic sea ice. It's retreating at a tremendous speed. So the accessibility of the living resources of the Arctic Ocean, also the minerals, they are actually easier um, to access for the countries, um, not only the Arctic um, nations, but also, as Professor Dots pointed out, the so-called near-Arctic or uh, interested states, so literally the entire world. Um, what do those mineral living resources of the Arctic Ocean actually um, entail? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, thank you for asking me. I'm humbled here <laughs> from, uh, I, uh, I mean, from from my position as uh, deputy secretary at the uh, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program Secretariat here in Tromsø. I, I have a a, a much uh, more uh, modest view <laughs> of uh, of the Arctic. But uh, let's say that uh, what we see now is that also from the uh, from the recent uh, from the recent uh, scientific. Uh, warnings is that we could have a much warmer arctic already in five years from now so we are talking uh, in 2027 we could have something that is even warmer than the warmest prediction so the ice free summers uh, up all the way to the north pole could be just around the corner uh, so this is one thing uh, then uh, uh, let's say that the uh, the uh, the mineral resources on the seabed uh, for the time being are diffi technically difficult to access i mean the difficult they are more expensive to access in other areas around indonesia for example so so it's not uh, that we are that there are uh, mining activities just waiting to start the day after tomorrow um because uh, yeah it's easier to get uh, hold of the same resources somewhere else and uh, and the living resources are also not particularly uh accessible now on the one side because of the of the uh, uh, the 2018 agreement uh, to prevent uh, the unregulated high sea fisheries in the central arctic ocean which imposes a moratorium that is more or less a moratorium during the time where it would not be profitable or it would not be interesting either to go up and, and fish uh, but um, it's also that uh, there is there are some physical um, barriers to the borealization of commercial species. We're thinking about, for example, Arctic uh, like uh, cod, like Barents Sea cod, which is the most uh, refined cod that is fished up here in Norway. Well, it would probably not move further north than the edge of the continental shelf. So, coming into the Nansen Basin north of Svalbard, it, the cod would stop, um, and and therefore do not it would probably not go over to the uh, the central arctic ocean and if you're talking about like uh, calanus or like uh, copepods like krill uh, krill is also much more accessible in the southern oceans than it is up in the in the very far north so i don't think that in the even with a with a potential warm, warming and, and nice free summers uh, very soon uh, I don't think that there is going to be anything uh, anything happening uh, technically but uh, just uh, as a finishing uh, point here is that um, like when we talk about the North Pole it is actually an ideal point it's a it's a dot it is a no dimension and it is right there and uh, and we have uh, like the the uh, the slices of the cake if you look at the earth from above the north pole that are already assigned for example for search and rescue to the uh, to the uh, let's say the arctic states that have uh, uh, a contiguous uh, um, uh, coastline um, so there is uh, there is already a division that is more or less uh, uh, approved for for search and rescue, and and it is these areas that go up to the north, these slices that are the ones that are very interesting for for these nations and uh, and uh, well it's going to be interesting times in the few in the few years ahead. <laughs> Absolutely, um, but coming from uh, the just the resources back to the on um, the geopolitical seg um, uh, segment of the, the 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 problem, when we see how the climate, the international climate, has changed in the past year, particularly with um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how has that crippled the discussions about the Arctic in in general, um, Professor Dots? We see that the Arctic Council, which has been a very important um, forum for intergovernmental uh, discussions um, away from security issues. Um, but other than that, it was a really important forum where actually um, the seven or the eight uh, Arctic nations 
we're discussing with the observer states and the indigenous uh, communities very, very deeply and thoroughly about uh, the shape of the Arctic of the future, which has been stopped since the invasion uh, of Ukraine. How has that crippled these efforts and how would that actually um, impact the, the Russian claim? So I, 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 I think the two are distinct. So what I, what I would say is, is there's, there's a kind of either or here. The, 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 on the one hand, um, Russia continues to engage and respect the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention and also uh, has just been noted rightly, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, Russia continues to be a party of that. And that does indeed impose a moratorium of 16 years on any kind of commercial fishing. But on the other hand, there's no getting away from it. Um, when the Arctic Council was paused shortly after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, it was a hammer blow to the kind of vision of the Arctic that the Arctic Council underpins. Since its creation in 1996, the Arctic Council has actively imagined the region as a circumpolar one where those Arctic states, indigenous peoples, uh, known for the, for the purposes of the council as permanent participants and observer uh, states and organizations work together but respectful of the sovereignty and the sovereign rights of those Arctic states and Arctic peoples. Now, in the aftermath of the pause of the Arctic Council, Effectively, what we're seeing is a bifurcated Arctic. We're seeing seven Arctic states continue to work with one another. And then on top of that, that seven Arctic state community, very, very shortly, are all going to be NATO Arctic states as well, given the admission of Finland and given the likely admission of Sweden in the near future. And the Russian Federation, which by dint of physical geography alone, represents 50% of the Arctic. You know, that's absolutely fundamental to keep in mind. And then prior to that pause of the Arctic Council, you know, it's, it's worth just going back and just reminding ourselves that with the annexation of Crimea in 2014, sanctions were imposed on the Russian Federation that in turn arguably encouraged the pivot towards countries like China and India and really, the long and short of it is, we've got two Arctics. We've got a kind of Western Arctic, for argument's sake, and we've got a Russian-Asian Arctic. And the, and the fear is, is that the Arctic Council won't be able to restart itself in the way that we might have hoped for, notwithstanding the fact that we have a Norwegian chairmanship, which arguably of all the Arctic states knows how to work with Russia best. Um, and that's our big challenge, is we've gone from a circumpolar Arctic into an Arctic fundamentally split in two. And fundamentally, it looks like that split is hardening, not softening. Mm. Eric, um, when, we, when we look at that scenario and we actually see that the largest Arctic state is isolated in not only the Arctic Council, but in global geopolitics, and we also see that Russia's Arctic officials are actually um, toning up their um, their voice when they talk about it, saying that um, Russia will stay in the Arctic Council as long as it serves our own interests. Or as um, uh, the foreign minister of, uh, of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, said, um, that Russia is open to work in the Arctic Council um, if there is a civilized conversation possible. How would that actually um, change the Arctic or the understanding of the Arctic if those rifts, as Professor Dots um, put it, would um, not soften but actually solidify? I don't think anybody has a uh, has a clear answer to this. This has been the topic of, of several episodes of, of, of my podcast. Um, is is it an A seven? Is that is that feasible? Is it viable? Uh, and it's it's quite a hotly debated issue and i don't think anybody's really come up with <laughs> taking a clear stand on this although actually some some of us said actually no i mean i was at the uh arctic circle assembly last uh, october and uh, a number of the the senior arctic officials 
I think the especially the the one from Finland uh, very was very clear that there there is no such thing as an A7. There, there can't be an Arctic Council without Russia, and legally I, I guess they can't be excluded from the um, from the Arctic Council either. You can you can pause the entire organization and you can have um, scientific cooperation in some of the working groups, but you can't legally just kick Russia out of the the Arctic Council. So it's some other uh, other venues forums would have to be uh, created uh, instead. I also, at the Arctic Circle Assembly, I spoke to a number of um, uh, indigenous peoples groups and, and some some um, observer countries, and they also felt that they they get in some ways um, hit hardest by this because of the, 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 such the prominent status of indigenous peoples groups uh, in the Arctic Council. If there is no Arctic functional Arctic Council, their voice is is not being heard in the same way as it had been previously, and the observer states as well they felt that that was a good way for them to to, to have their interests. Uh, put forward. And now they're, they're also perhaps uh, kind of wondering where to turn to next, what other forms, like the Arctic Circle Assembly, maybe uh, rises in significance, even though it's not a, a political organization. It has it has some sort of political aspects to it as well, being very much um, supported by the government of of, uh, of Iceland. And maybe you could say the same thing about Arctic Frontiers uh, and its uh, connect- connections to the uh, Norwegian government. So uh, yeah, I think there's still quite a bit of uncertainty that the changeover to the Norwegian um chair of the Arctic Council. Maybe that thaws things to some extent, but I I still don't see it as being um, a viable functional organization as long as the the current situation in Ukraine um, uh, continues. And whether other forums and other, I'm sure there's there's quite a bit of behind the scenes interactions going on between the seven Arctic uh, countries, uh, ex-Russia, uh, on diplomatic levels, on scientific exchanges, and so forth. But uh, I don't think there's any any clear answers yet. I think we're still kind of fumbling around trying to find uh, a way forward here. And Mario, on the on a theoretical level, the A7, even though everyone rejects that idea, are technically functioning already, as uh, a lot of scientific projects have actually been picked up after. Um, the seven Arctic countries, uh, excluding Russia, have paused the Arctic Council um, cooperation with Russia. But shortly after they picked up the scientific efforts, or at least a couple of those projects, um, all those projects, as I understood, which not include Russia. Is that right? Well, uh, first of all, uh, for uh, like a, if I keep my my aim up hat on my Arctic monitoring assessment program hat on. Uh, there were never the A7 or the Arctic 7 don't exist. They are not uh, anything we talk about at work. Um, and uh, the pause was not a, a pause of cooperation with Russia. It was a pause in the work of the Arctic Council. So uh, that is the uh, that is the let's say the probably the most stringent of a correct way of expressing it. Uh, the fact, of course, uh, the, uh, the problem was for the working groups, and especially like for AMAP, which is uh, one of the working groups that predates the, uh, the Arctic Council, uh, the foundation of the Arctic Council, and actually come from the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy of 1991. Um, we have a... Uh, a, a problem we have had a, a problem that the the collection and the uh, continuation of the scientific work the collection of the data needs to continue i mean taking a break in in collecting and, and elaborating data about the climate about the the, the tundra for example which is uh, uh, by a large part uh, in russian territory is uh, is, a, is a huge problem so the um, the thing that happened was that uh, the projects, uh, the the activities of the different working groups were uh, listed. Uh, we were requested to list the uh, the different projects and uh, and then to uh, like flag the ones where there was uh, Russian uh, cooperation uh, or a, a significant Russian participation, and uh, and those were the ones that were put on pause because of the uh, difficulties in communicating and in uh, taking decisions on these projects. Because uh, when we do projects, 
we have at one point to make decisions, financial decisions, decision of the direction of the project, and and these have to be taken according to the rules of the Arctic Council, which is uh, that there has to be a plenum and it has to be a consensus uh, on the direction to be taken. So with no participation of Russia, there was effectively no decisions that could be made. So that was the uh, that was a big uh, the big problem in continuing, but a, a few and actually probably I would say that uh, a large majority of projects have continued uh, or scientific projects and scientific activities have continued as far as possible uh, without Russian participation. And those were projects that already didn't have Russian participation and those that had Russian participation have been paused totally and, and that is a huge problem. But uh, to go back to um, Professor Dodd's uh, point here, uh, the Norwegian chairship, and this is uh, uh, a term that uh, the Norwegians introduce, chairship to be gender neutral, um, and they call it leadership as well, <laughs> uh, and the Norwegian leadership of the Arctic Council, if you prefer, uh, is uh, promising. Um, Norway has the intention of uh, making the Arctic Council functional again. That's a stated uh, intention. Um, the uh, interesting uh, thing is that uh, they have been able to transfer already the chairship from Russia to Norway by modifying slightly the procedures so by agreeing that it wouldn't be a ministerial meeting it was just a, a meeting of the senior Arctic officials the um, participation or the intervention of uh, mr lavrov uh, was a recorded intervention at the beginning uh, was particularly shocking but uh, it was uh, quite uh, like it was firmly responded to by the other states, the other Arctic states, but it was responded in a very professional way. Mr. Korchunov, the chair of the, the outgoing chair of the Arctic Council, was extremely professional as well. Everybody was extremely professional in this meeting. I was particularly impressed by everybody and everybody agreed that uh, they would not uh, uh, accept anything about uh, the situation in Ukraine uh, that had not been already stated before by any of the states, but they all agreed, including Russia, that the Arctic Council is the high-level forum where things and discussion in the Arctic can be discussed and should be discussed in spite of uh, all of the different articles that came out afterwards. The, com the conferences or the assemblies like the Arctic Circle Assemblies and Arctic Frontiers are not, uh, uh, have tried to fill or they have filled effectively the void left by the lack of communication within the Arctic Council. Um, but uh, they are not uh, the political, the high level political forum that they have. So they, they serve other functions in spite of the especially Arctic frontiers. Uh, here I, we can see it that there is a, a political, or the, the policy part and the, the science part with Arctic uh, Circle. I've, I've unfortunately never been able to assist, but uh, there's more the policy part, but they, they try to, to communicate uh, same or on the same level as the Arctic Council, but they are, they are very different in, in essence and uh, they are useful and very nice to have, <laughs> very useful to, to have, but they would not be substituting the Arctic Council itself. And I think that science, especially going back to the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy Agreement signed in Rovaniemi in 1991, uh, I think that we should go back and, and look at that treaty and uh, that's a big agreement and it's a foundation of not only EMA but the whole Arctic Council and CAF and all the Convention of Arctic Fauna and Flora and the, the, the um, PAME, the protection of the Arctic marine environment especially and, and here we have the, uh, the foundation for the future I think. Absolutely and um, I feel also that the Arctic Circle Assembly, for example, is more an informal forum to discuss things you would probably not discuss in a more formal setting like the Arctic Council. Yeah. Um, but 
uh, Russia has put the ball into uh, Norway's hands and just said that their responsibility for the future of a restored council lies in the new uh, chairship. Um, and I would love to give the closing remarks to uh, both of you, Professor Dots first and um, right after uh, Eric. No, thank, thank you. And, and I, I think the, the assessment I, I would make is, is partly building on the comments from the Norwegian chairship, So, which is, I think, being quite straightforward, which is, on the one hand, the immediate task of the chairship is to ensure that the Arctic Council survives. So I think that's the, the priority of the next two years. And then secondly, I suspect we will also be reminding ourselves about what was possible Uh, during some of the more awkward moments of Arctic collaboration and cooperation during, for example, the Cold War. And it's worth, it's worth saying, for example, that the, the notable polar bear agreement, the Mamansk initiative, they came out of the backdrop of profound awkwardness. And I, and I suspect what we'll end up concluding is that there will be ways again through science and other forms of diplomacy to build or to rebuild relations with Russia. And it might well involve the uh, third parties who are trusted on both sides to ensure that in the end, the Arctic is a circumpolar region and it's one with powerful indigenous on the one hand, but also global uh, entanglements and connections. And, and that won't change uh, regardless of uh, the obviously worsening relationship with Russia as a consequence of the Ukrainian invasion. Thank you, Professor Dots. Uh, Eric? Yeah, well, I, like, I like to believe in the, uh, the idea of, of science diplomacy, as, as Klaus brought up. But I was, I was also quite interested with some of the comments that Mario made about sort of the, the administrative and the, the financial complications that um, they really make it difficult to even operate on a working group level inside of the Arctic Council uh, without Russia's uh, full participation, and since there's a, it's a consensus-based uh, decision-making in the Arctic Council. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say how this, this will play out. I mean, I, I'm generally optimistic. I think the Norwegians, I think as Klaus mentioned, also have a, have a good way of dealing with Russia, a lot of experience with that, uh, maybe them and, and the Finns as well um, could, could help on that on that front. Uh, But yeah, I, I have a hard time seeing the Arctic Council being a fully functional organization uh, anytime in the in the near future. And at the same time, I I don't see the um, yeah the Arctic um, being uh, governable without Russia. It's uh, it's it's such geographically it's just so so dominant. Um, yeah, there could be a, a period of fragmentation going on uh, in the in the months and, and perhaps years to come with different uh, constellations. Uh, taking shape but uh, yeah well, I guess it remains to, to be seen how this uh, will play out Thank you very much gentlemen we are coming to an end of uh, today's episode Professor Dots where do our listeners and viewers can find uh, further information to you and your projects um, Well if they want to read some of my work then um, obviously I'd be hugely excited if they found their way towards Uh, various uh, websites, Amazon being one, and you could certainly find out more about my recent work. My latest work is called Border Wars, which was published by uh, Penguin, and that addresses all the different ways in which we argue about lines on the map and lines on the ground, including those underneath the, wo underneath the world's seas and oceans. Fantastic book, certainly a recommendation. We're going to talk about that in a later episode, I'm sure. Uh, and Eric, where can we lead our listeners for your podcasts and projects? Yeah, well, my uh, the Polar Geopolitics podcast is uh, it's available on the all the um, various platforms, uh, Apple and Google and Spotify and so forth. So I would certainly recommend uh, finding us there. Uh, it's also polargeopolitics.com is the uh, the website. Uh, my own personal research. I've done some work in the Arctic, uh, several articles about Svalbard. Um, I could also recommend a, a book that uh, Klaus has um, co-edited, uh, Ice Humanities, recently with uh, with my colleague Sverker mm -hmm. Sorlin. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the kind of work that that, that we do at my um, my department at uh, KTH, more of a humani uh, humanities perspective on uh, on the Arctic and the polar regions. Thank you very much, both of you, Professor Dots and Eric Paglia. Um, and that being said, I throw the ball back to you, Chris. 
let me do my job because um, this is the end of the episode that was it for today thank you all for um, tuning in for sticking with us a special shout out to all the subscribers we see you we appreciate your support and of course a huge thank you to our guests Professor Klaus Dotz and uh, Eric Paglia for joining us and sharing their insights as usual you know the drill you can find us online at curiouslypolar.com and don't forget to follow us on our socials or on your socials wherever you are can't wait to have you all back with us for the next episode until then take care everyone and 